our uh, next speaker for today's evening session is Dr. Dheeraj Ka Dheeraj Kalat, our senior consultant, the Department of Medical Gastroenterology. He is going to educate all of us on uh, the GI emergencies and how to handle them. What do you say? Thank you. Uh, I see a packed hall in the middle of the week. That's very good. So people are inclined to learn about emergencies. That's very interesting. But most of these emergencies, I would say, are very difficult to manage in a clinical care setting. The identification of the signs where they should be immediately shifted to a higher care center is what is very important. So, so I will be talking on gastrointestinal emergencies under these few headings. I will try to wind up within the next 20 minutes. So, we will discuss about a GI bleed, foreign body in the gastrointestinal tract, an acute abdomen which is more of a surgical purview but I will tell you what an acute abdomen should be looked for in an acute presentation of an abdominal pain, acute dysphagia, cholangitis, hepatic encephalopathy and of course acute constipation, most, uh, most bothersome symptom to any human being gets relieved very easily by a simple clinical manual. So, we will go through all of these. So, gastrointestinal bleed can be either an upper GI bleed from the upper tract above the ligament of treats or from anywhere below it which could be a small intestine or the large intestine. The commonest cause for a small amount of gastrointestinal bleed which is which may be massive sometimes is hemorrhoids. The commonest cause for a upper GI bleed is either a esophageal varices where you can see here or an ulcer within the stomach which can present as a peptic ulcer related bleed which is a very common medical emergency that we see. How do patients present? It is either hematochezia, hematemesis or is it a melin? So, this usually patients nowadays with all the mobiles available, they come with these photographs. But the most important history is whether there was a dark tarry stools, whether there was fresh blood in the stools or whether there was uh, coffee ground vomitus followed by fresh blood in the stools. So, these things help us differentiate whether it is a purely upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed. About 10 to 30 percent of the massive upper GI bleeds wherein they have torrentially blood, they will present with fresh blood in the stools because the rapid transit of the blood through the intestinal tract makes them present as a hematochezia rather than as melina. So, in about 30 percent of the cases this is so and we should be very careful in history taking and clinical examination. A patient's hemodynamic status tells us whether it is upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed and the history of course, the subtleties of the history. So, these are the common causes for an upper GI bleed. In the, of the world over, 50 percent of the cases of upper GI bleed are due to peptic ulcer disease which is commonly a duodenal ulcer. The next comes esophageal varices which is secondary to a liver disease either due to a viral disease as commonly seen in India or due to ethanol or nowadays the next new epidemic that is NASH related liver disease. The rest of all, all are very rare. You can see malary V's, tumors and all those things. They are all very rare causes. If you know that the bleed is either variceal or non variceal that is the most important differentiation that a gastroenterologist has to make. So, this is how the images look when you do an endoscopy I will show you more images. So, in a lower GI bleed what are the common causes? The angiodysplasia, ischemia, carcinoma colon, pol polyps, either inflammatory bowel disease, the Meckel's diverticulum which is just close or within two feet of the ileocecal junction, carcinoma, solitary rectal, of the rectal ulcers and hemorrhoids. These are the common causes for lower GI bleeds, but the by far the most difficult bleeds as far as I am concerned are diverticular bleeds which are seen in elderly people. They, they are benign causes of bleed, but the problem is identifying the cause of bleed. The trick in identifying a diverticular bleed I will talk to you as we go through these slides. If you see this slide, what are the things that commonly a patient with a massive GI bleed presents is vomiting of blood either coffee ground or fresh blood or black tarry stools. The rest of the things are you know mostly clinical examination and assessment of hemodynamic status. So, if you look at the entire GI tract, these are the various causes of bleed. Above the ligament of traits is an upper GI bleed, below the ligament of traits is a lower GI bleed. The color is not always an indicator as I told about one third of the cases of GI bleed can be upper GI bleed but present as hematochezia. So, what do you do in a GI bleed? As usual, the airway, breathing and the circulation transfusion of blood to be arranged as early as possible to keep the blood ready depending on the hemodynamic status of the patient. And octreotide was the pre previous drug that we used to use. The problem with octreotide was we had to give an infusion. Today we have a wonderful drug called terlipressin 
which can be given as bolus shots, especially for variceal bleeds, either a fundal variceal bleed or an esophageal variceal bleed. It can be repeated every 6th hourly in a dose of 0.5 milligram. The only caveat is that you should look at the ECG before you give this. Any underlying cardiac arrhythmias can get worsened. So, terlipressin is the new drug. Antibiotics are a must, not in cases of non variceal GI bleed or ulcer related bleed, but it is must in cases of variceal bleed where there is a liver disease because the commonest cause of death after a GI bleed is secondary infection due to bacterial translocation. And antibiotics have been found to be life saving in this group of patients. Whether there is a role of tranexamic acid, the answer is no. We do not have a role for tranexamic acid in these bleeds. Do we need to place an NG tube? The answer is again no, it does not make any difference. What are the goals of resuscitation? Is to keep the blood pressure at about 100 systolic if it is a variceal bleed. If it is a non variceal bleed, about 120 is the target blood pressure systolic. These are various scores which, scores which are used for duodenal ulcer related bleeds clinically have no role. Basically, what you have to look at is the hemodynamic status of the patient, heart rate, the blood pressure, how, how much of a shock is in, is the, are the peripheries cold. Then a simple clinical history, is there a history of past liver disease wherein there is a clear cut suspicion of a variceal bleed. If there is no history of liver disease, then it is most likely a non variceal bleed. The commonest cause as of today for a non variceal bleed is the use of over the counter NSAIDs. Either they would have been taking a diclofenac or a ibuprofen for a low backache, for a migraine. You just have to probe the history, it will come out. It just takes two good minutes and you will find the answer. If there is still a confusion, a clinical examination for presence of minimal pedal edema, a clinical examination of the abdomen to palpate the spleen will tell you if there is pedal edema and splenomegaly, you are looking at a variceal bleed because terlipressin will be life saving. If there is still a doubt, infuse both pantoprazole infusion and terlipressin. But if you are clear and you know this patient has got liver disease and he has come with variceal bleed, you start with terlipressin antibiotic, arrange for blood depending on the amount of blood loss. So, these are how the things look like. These are esophageal varices, the large blue veins. This is how a rubber band is applied for the esophageal varices. This is how a diurnal ulcer looks like, especially when it is pigmented and not actively oozing. This is a nightmare for any gastroenterologist, spurting vessel. Previously, we used to use this sclerotherapy injections, go in and inject all around and elevate it and cause tamponade to arrest the bleed. Thank God to the, thanks to the Lord to, for us making the availability of these clips. We have plenty of clips now, different companies manufacture them at reasonably priced rates and if you can apply a clip over a vessel, you can arrest the bleed very easily. Now, as I was mentioning, the lower GI bleed, nightmare is a diverticular bleed always. Look at the number of diverticular in this small segment that I am seeing. Sometimes a patient, especially uh, elderly people come with diverticular bleed, we do a hurried endoscopy, we go in, we see blood everywhere, we see diverticulum everywhere. Now, which diverticulum is causing a bleed, we do not know. Okay, we will take another scenario, the patient has come hemodynamically stabilized, we have given him blood, but next day morning we have prepped him with the colonoscopy preparation, he has passed a lot of stools, the colon is clear. Go in, look at multiple diverticular, we do not know which has blood. To do it emergency, to do it later, still you are in a catch 22 situation in a diverticular. That is the biggest problem with the diverticular bleed because when you go in, in my last 12 years, believe me, I have seen only 4 cases where there was a spurting diverticular and I could clip it. In the rest of the cases, it is always a catch, uh, you know, cat and mouse game. You have to go in when it is bleeding, but by the time if the diverticular has stopped bleed, there is blood everywhere, there are diverticular everywhere. You do not know which diverticulum has caused the bleed. So, very difficult. The other thing that you can do in diverticular bleed is when they come, if the bleeding rate is too high and if the creatinine is good, you ask your interventional radiology colleague whether he can intervene. He goes in, does an angiogram, CT angiogram initially, localizes the bleed. If not a regular angiogram, you know, conventional angiogram, if he can embolize that particular vessel, then it is it's a great relief. You can, you can always you know, get away without doing much. So, diverticular bleeds are always a nightmare. The other things. The other massive bleeds that we see is polypectomy bleeds. We do a polypectomy, we send the patient home after 24 hours, they come back with a massive bleed because the base of the polyp would have had an artery which would have you know given way and caused bleed. At least in those situations, we know where the bleed is and it is easy to identify and clip them.